Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless ephesians 6 12 but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Unidentified flying objects have been an obsession for decades, spawning speculation and wild conspiracy theories. But are any of these mysterious UFO sightings proof of life beyond Earth? Tonight, after generations of investigation and theories, the government is pulling back the curtain, trying to separate fact from fiction. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that, man. Look at that. After decades of mysterious sightings, the Pentagon's top UFO investigator speaking exclusively to ABC News. What surprised you most since you took over? There are a number of things that surprised me. The government probe covering hundreds of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, like this declassified U.S. Navy video. Oh my gosh, dude. The unusual object flying quickly through restricted airspace off the East Coast in 2015. <laughs> Some phenomena shocking everyday Americans, too. I swear to God, this is not a joke. A Las Vegas family last month called 911 adamant extraterrestrial creatures had landed in their backyard. They're like nine foot, ten foot tall. They look like aliens to us. These are retrieving non-human origin uh, technical vehicles. One whistleblower is so convinced, he says the government has pieces of alien spacecraft under lock and key. Yeah, they're sophisticatedly engineered, um, certainly not by humans. And Hollywood is feeding the fascination. She has arrived. Now that's a proper introduction. So do aliens exist? And are those unidentified aerial phenomena evidence they visited Earth? To separate fact from fiction, we went to the man leading a search for answers from inside the Pentagon. I'm a long-term intelligence officer, scientist, and military officer. Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, in his first television interview after a year on the job, told us everything is on the table. What keeps you up at night? Technical surprise. And that could be adversary technical surprise or extraterrestrial technical surprise. Kirkpatrick leads the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO, created by Congress last year to detect, identify, and attribute mysterious objects of interest in the air, in outer space, and even underwater. It's a big job. Yes. The top priorities, he says, are mitigating threats to the safety of military personnel and dispelling myths. What's the most common misconception people have of UAPs or of the work you're doing? That they're all the same thing and they're all extraterrestrial. Um, and neither of those are true. His office is investigating more than 800 cases of potential UAPs reported by military pilots and service members. We have to go through the, the rigor of taking each one, matching it against our known objects and known catalogs and then reviewing that, peer reviewing that, making sure that everybody's in agreement. But there's not an explanation for everything, most notably the so-called Tic Tac incident off the California coast in 2004. I can tell you, I, I think it was not from this world. David Fravor is a retired Navy F-18 pilot who spotted the object, seeming to move at impossible speeds. He spoke with ABC News in 2017. We get a call from USS Princeton. He gives us a bearing range and altitude report. He's calling a contact for us that they want us to investigate. So as we start driving out there, I said, what are we looking for? And he said, we don't know. He said, we've seen these objects. And they hang out at 20,000, then they go straight back up above 80,000 and disappear. There's two people in each jet, so four heads, eight eyeballs. And we start looking around. And right about that time, I was like, dude, do you see that? I go, what is that? So we're looking down, and there's a disturbance in the water. Right next to it was this little white object that looks like a Tic Tac, and it's just above the surface of the water, and it's moving around left, right, forward, back, just random. 
no controlled thing. There is no rotor wash, there is no jet wash. I say, hey, I'm gonna go down and check it out. We start coming down, so now we're in a clockwise flow, going from 12 to three, and it starts going from six to nine. And it's coming up, and we're going down. We start to cut across, it rapidly accelerates, climbs past our altitude and disappears. That's the last we saw of it. What's your best guess of what happened there? It's really hard to guess on this, and, and I don't like to guess. So have you hit a dead end with this one then? The more things that I see that resemble a tic-tac, then I can get more and more information about what that is. Kirkpatrick says between 95 and 98 percent of cases reviewed by his office are readily explainable. Large birds, balloons, debris, or drones, but a small number remain a mystery. So that two to five percent, which are anomalous incidents, which you're still looking into, could potentially be extraterrestrial activity? So we are going to follow our data and our investigations wherever it goes, right? So I, I have a full range of hypotheses. So you can't rule it out? I can't rule it out, but I don't have any evidence that says that yet. Most Americans believe intelligent life exists beyond Earth, and a majority say UAPs under investigation are likely proof of contact. Some former Pentagon insiders claim the government has more evidence than it's publicly acknowledged. Kirkpatrick says he's seen nothing to back up those claims. You can say categorically you've seen no convincing, I have seen confirmable no evidence convincing. of intact spacecraft kept by the U.S. government. No. I have seen nothing that leads me to that conclusion. Is it possible there is some secret program that you're just not aware of? I don't think so. I have access to anything and everything I need. Why do you think these whistleblowers are coming forward? Well, one, I think the recent law, which extended whistleblower protections to them and, and named Arrow as the author, authorized disclosure authority, uh, opens the door for them to, to come and tell us exactly what they think they, they saw or know about. You believe them? I believe that they believe what they're telling me. And I, my job is not to, it's not a question of belief, right? It's a question of what can I go research? Investigating UAPs has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. My priority is that we understand the full range of threats posed by our adversaries in all domains. Multiple congressional committees have held hearings. There is something there measurable by multiple instruments and yet it seems to move in directions that are inconsistent with what we know of physics or science uh, more broadly. And even the White House now weighing in. We're not saying what they are or what they're not. We're saying that there's something our pilots are seeing. We're saying it has had an effect on some of our training operations, and so we want to get to the bottom of it. Top Democrats and Republicans have called for greater transparency, proposing legislation this month that would force the government to publicly release records on UAPs within 25 years of when they were created. So a lot of these allegations crop up again and again over history. Do you think extraterrestrial life is out there? I think it's statistically unrealistic to think it isn't. I mean, given, given the vastness of the universe. Are you going to find it on your watch? Well, wouldn't that be fun? I mean, that would be probably the best outcome of this job. Could an alien deception be the strong delusion God sends on an unbelieving and unrepentant world in the last days? Recently, interest has been rising in the theory that an alien deception will be part of the end times. Odd as it may seem, this theory is entirely plausible from a Christian perspective. Although the Bible gives us no word about whether or not aliens exist, there is no inclusion of them in the creation account in Genesis, and no mention of them elsewhere. The Bible does tell us about visitors from another world, the spiritual world, as we read in Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Could this phenomenon be the strong delusion of the last days that is talked about in the Bible? 2 Thessalonians 2.9-12 the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why is God sending a strong delusion? The Bible makes it clear. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Simply put, 
God sends a strong delusion to those who choose not to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah puts it succinctly. Just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions, and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Christians must deal with this from a biblical worldview, and not be caught up in the deception that UFOs are anything but agents of the prince of the power of the air, aka Satan. The rapture is a familiar concept to most Christians and non-Christians alike. While they may not believe it, and they may even laugh at it, many non-Christians know that all the Christians believe that they are supposed to somehow disappear before the end of the world. Satan would seem to have a problem. How would he be able to explain away the fact that every person who was a Christian has suddenly disappeared? It would seem like a huge wake-up call to the world that the Christians were right after all. It is becoming more and more clear what Satan's solution to this dilemma is. He will answer this preposterous idea, the rapture, with another preposterous idea, an alien deception. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 tells Christians they will disappear from the earth someday. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. one issue that can bring Democrats and Republicans together, it's UFOs. Why is the military and the government not just being honest with us? Why are they overclassifying it? Why aren't they being transparent? They keep telling us they don't exist, but they block every opportunity for us to get a hold of the information to prove that they do exist. And we're going to get to the bottom of it, dadgummit, whatever the truth may be. The House Oversight Committee announcing a hearing with actual eyewitnesses for what the government calls UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And the Biden administration this week admitting that these things are having an actual impact on our military. Some of these phenomena, we know, have already had uh, an impact on our training ranges for, you know, when pilots are out trying to do training in the air and they see these things, they're not sure what they are, and it can have an impact on their ability to perfect their skills. There's something our pilots are seeing. Joining me now is Jeremy Corbell, investigative journalist and co-host of Weaponize. It's a podcast that explores the unexplained. Jeremy, what do we know about these some things that pilots are seeing that I guess are interfering even with training missions? Well, our government knows a lot about them, but the public does not. And, and the issue is really, it doesn't matter where these machines are from. We know they outpace, outmaneuver, and overperform any of our weaponry. We know they're not China. We know they're not Russia. We know they're not ours. So what we're looking to do is avoid strategic surprise. It doesn't matter where UFOs are from. What matters is we don't have a 360 view of what's going on in our airspace for the safety of our pilots, but also for the safety of America. So that's what this hearing is about, this unprecedented hearing, unlike anything that has ever come before. Well, a lot of the skeptics are saying, well, this is just, this is new technology that's coming from China or Russia. And Congressman uh, Burchett had a really good retort to that claim. If Russia owned it, we, they wouldn't be battling in Ukraine. It'd be over. China, they would control us. Even They pretty much do now, but even more so. It's either something from that's extraterrestrial or something that we, that we have in our skunk works and listen to the pilots. It defies all of our laws of physics. The human body would not be able to stand the pressure from this thing. It, it's, it's beyond belief. Jeremy, I just want to hear more and more and more on this. I mean, yeah, this look, is just all wild. of America. The whole world is fascinated by this because guess what? UFOs have been a part of the human experience since before there was even a Pentagon or a Department of Defense. So this idea that it's just some technology built by another unknown nation, it doesn't hold water. The question is who's operating this craft? What's the intent? How do they have these performance capabilities? It's really important to understand this is not a new topic. You go all the way back to presidencies way back in the day, and people ran on tickets to, to tell the truth about UFOs. So it's about time, and we're getting 
closer and closer with every day. These hearings are historic. First-hand, direct eyewitnesses, people that have actually engaged UFOs in combat situations, even training. So that's what we're going to see come next week. Jeremy, can you explain for us, to the extent that you know this, how are these operating, from what they can understand, that defy the laws of physics, to put the pressure on, on a regular human pilot that would be unsustainable by the human body? Explain that. Right. So that, that's a huge story, but essentially it has to do with the, with the propulsion systems themselves. What I can tell you is what we're observing, not how it works. That's what we need to find out. What we're observing are objects that can go what they call transmedium from space to air to sea without any inertial effect. So they're able to go at right angle turns at thousands of miles an hour. This is something that we have radar footage, satellite footage of. The public deserves to know this exists. And then the question becomes, Whose are they? What will you do if it is reported that these UFOs are extraterrestrial? Will it shake your faith? If a UFO lands and these extraterrestrials, who are fallen angels, claim to be our creators, will you believe this lie? Stay strong in the faith, brothers and sisters. This could be the strong delusion God sends on an unbelieving world. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24:12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Chilling new details about the suspect and the deadly ambush of police officers in Fargo, North Dakota. Funeral services were held today for Officer Jake Waleen, killed as he worked the scene of a traffic crash last week. Two other officers were injured. Today, dozens lining the streets to pay their respects. Authorities now saying the suspect, fatally shot by police, was likely planning an even bigger attack. Tonight, Officer Jake Waleed laid to rest. As authorities in Fargo, North Dakota say the gunman behind a deadly police ambush was possibly planning a larger attack. He faced down a murderous and evil person who was committing to harming others so that others wouldn't have to. Nearly a week after that street shootout, authorities now revealing new details about the suspect, Mohammed Barakat. Police say Barakat's internet history showed searches for explosive ammo, kill fast, and mass shooting events, and even a search for a downtown street fair the night before the shooting. In the days leading up to there, he's looking for specifically to the region for um, large crowd events in the region. Waleen and two other officers on the scene of a fender bender on July 14th, when police say Barakat opened fire from inside this car. Its back window spray painted black. Barakat allegedly armed with a long rifle and handgun. Police say Barakat exited the car, still firing. Waleen, an Army National Guardsman, just sworn in about three months ago, fatally struck. Two officers and a civilian wounded before Barakat was shot dead by a fourth officer. Inside Barakat's car, authorities say they found this massive arsenal, including a homemade grenade, gasoline canisters, and propane tanks containing improvised explosives. The horrible winds of fate. It's the best explanation I have for you for how he saw those officers on the way to where we, we believe he was going. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 
But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. As sweltering temps sweep the nation for yet another week, another dramatic rescue for heat-exhausted hikers, this time in California, captured on the Citizen app. The L.A. Fire Department says its chopper airlifted a pair of hikers to safety, hiking proving deadly. This just days after a man died trekking through Death Valley, and two women were found dead on a hiking trail Saturday just outside Las Vegas. Over in Arizona's Maricopa County, the heat claiming at least 18 lives since April. The heat dome now expanding to the Midwest. While down south, EMS is putting in overtime. Yes, we are. We're definitely seeing an uh, increase in heat related calls. Obviously puts an extra strain on the 911 system as a whole. Even a place like Miami that expects heat, we're talking about 43 straight days of real feels in the triple digits. It's just downright miserable. <laughs> Desperation on the island of Rhodes, Greece, where tens of thousands are fleeing for their lives from out of control fires, winds flaring up as southern Europe bakes under a brutal heat wave. Jack Neal and his family visiting from England, walking four miles to escape the danger. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, no. I've, I've never been afraid to die, but yesterday I had that fear in me. Crews now working around the clock to contain the disaster in what's become the largest evacuation in the country's history. This looks like what you see after a hurricane or refugees fleeing a war. But these are all tourists who had to flee their hotels and have nowhere else to go. Now desperately seeking information about what comes next. Holidays turned to horror as more of this island is going up in flames. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Overwhelming heat, setting new records from California feels hot. to Florida, where Miami has now hit 40 consecutive days of a triple digit heat index. It's sticky and hot and awful and kind of hell-like. The unprecedented heat due in part to sweltering sea temperatures. University of Miami sea rise expert Brian McNoldy telling our Sam Brock those warm waters could cause hurricanes to strengthen more rapidly than normal. You're more prone to get a rapid intensification, you know, where hurricanes can go from some intensity and very quickly become a lot stronger. The staggering heat is especially dangerous for the elderly and very young. In Harlingen, Texas, a dramatic moment to save a baby accidentally locked inside a hot car. While in Phoenix, where temperatures have hit at least 110 for more than three straight weeks, some say staying indoors for so long is taking a toll on their mental health. It's very depressing because it's like a ghost town and you don't see anybody anywhere. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, the new CDC director highlighting the emergence of heat officers in local governments. We're seeing for the first time where folks are um, designating someone as the, you know, in charge of responding to the heat. And for those who have no choice but to work outside, one construction company in North Texas has some of its employees wearing sensors to send an alert if they start to overheat. And it'll alert me ahead of time, like, you still feel fine, but you're in danger of overheating, let's take a break. A new safety system that could become more common on a rapidly warming planet. It's sticky and hot and awful and kind of hell-like. This world may seem hell-like, but it is the most heaven many people will ever see before they end up in the real hell. Don't be that person. Call upon the name of Jesus today. What did Jesus say or teach about hell? Hell is a fiery furnace. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of outer darkness, sorrow, and pain. Matthew 22:13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is eternal. Matthew 25:46. 46. 
and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 24 through 26. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Hell is a place of separation. Luke 16.26 And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The Bible speaks of the reality of hell in the same terms as the reality of heaven. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In fact, Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did in comforting them with the hope of heaven. The concept of a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in hell is just as biblical as a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in heaven. Trying to separate them is simply not possible from a biblical standpoint. The good news is, no one has to go to hell. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Rescue teams resume work despite the rain and strong winds. They had halted efforts on Thursday due to bad weather. The hilltop location and tough terrain are hindering operations. Several bodies were recovered after Thursday's landslide, about 60 kilometers from Mumbai. Houses have been flattened and streets submerged, and dozens are still missing. Heavy rains have also battered the neighboring state of Gujarat. Some areas are submerged, isolating villages. Rising water levels in dams and overflowing rivers are raising concerns about flooding. The water has entered our houses and everything is damaged. There is water everywhere, inside shops and in houses. We have suffered a lot of losses as the water came suddenly from the nearby area. Heavy rains this month have led to flooding across several regions. In the last two weeks, capital New Delhi witnessed the worst flooding in more than 40 years. And it's not over yet, as officials are forecasting heavy rain in the coming days. I'm Aaron Gilchrist, tracking historic flooding on the Canadian East Coast. A dramatic scene in Halifax, rescuers lowering into rushing floodwaters, battling ferocious wind to airlift a camper. Four people, including two children, went missing when the cars they were in became submerged. People forced to wade into high water as thunderstorms in Nova Scotia dumped nearly a foot of rain since Friday morning. We got three months worth of rain in less than 24 hours. It came fast and it came furious. In the aftermath, firefighters zip lining over washed out roads, trying to move supplies and stranded people. With states of emergency now in effect as Canadians try to dry out and survey the damage. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, 
God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. And out of the crisis in Israel, the country is being swept by massive protests against a court reform plan that critics call a threat to democracy as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was rushed to the hospital Sunday with a heart problem. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burgess in Jerusalem. Good morning, Tom. George, you can hear the anger on the streets. The vote in the Israeli parliament just taking place. Protesters not able to get near the parliament because of the police, but protesters spilling right down the road. There is real anger on the streets of Jerusalem right now. This morning, anger on the streets of Jerusalem as Israeli lawmakers pass a controversial and divisive new law, stripping Israel's Supreme Court of a key power, preventing it from striking down controversial government decisions. Earlier, angry crowds massing near the Israeli parliament, police carrying away protesters and firing water cannon to disperse crowds overnight. This weekend, former Israeli security chiefs signing a letter backing a threat from thousands of army reservists saying they'll no longer serve when the reforms go through. And before today's crucial vote, President Biden wading in, releasing a statement calling on Israeli leaders to seek consensus and not rush their, quote, divisive judicial reforms. Protesters descending on Jerusalem from all over the country, many marching for days, some camping outside the parliament saying today's vote is wrecking Israeli democracy. We're angry that people are trying to change this country. We will not succumb to this craziness that's overcome Israel. The Israeli government saying its reforms will curb what it says are excessive powers of unelected judges. But amid the turmoil, fresh questions this weekend about the health of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in hospital for an emergency heart procedure. But this morning out and present at today's controversial vote. In the last days, Jerusalem will be the focal point of world politics as we read in Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. A lifelong Democrat. My family, my parents, but that's over, that's finished. The Democratic Party turns its back on its friends like Israel. It took a long, long time but I am delighted to join the Republican Party. Dove Hyken served as a state lawmaker in New York for decades as a Democrat. But now that prominent members of his former party are ramping up criticism of Israel and even boycotting the Israeli president's address to Congress, he says Democrats have abandoned him and so many others, so he's joining the Republican Party. Dove, thanks for being here. We've had you on the program many times as a Democrat, uh, today for the first time as a Republican. Uh, what was the moment where you said, I can't do this anymore? I, th I think it's uh, what's happened the last couple of weeks. It's uh, President Biden uh, becoming a replica of Obama and Jimmy Carter in treating the state of Israel and the people of Israel the way he has. You know, this is one of the great democracies. I'm actually in Jerusalem. I'm watching the demonstrations in the streets all the time, all over the country. For the Biden administration, for the president, to get involved and criticize Israel in terms of its democracy, I, honestly, he's out of his mind. It's, it's really insane what is going on. And it's everything else in the Democratic Party. It's uh, defund the police. It's a Democratic Party that is more concerned about the criminal 
treating the criminal right than the victims of crime. The radicalization, the legitimization of anti-Semitism by the radicals in the Democratic Party who play such a role, enough is enough. I have watched this, I'm sick and tired of it, and I'm tired of good people in the Democratic <clears throat> Party who are afraid to do the right thing. When you are an anti-Semite, doesn't matter if you're a member of Congress or, or whatever, you are to be condemned, you are to be ostracized. That's not the way the Democratic Party behaves. So enough is enough. Look, no party is perfect. We know that, okay? I always joke, you know, only God is perfect. Bottom line is that I urge people, I urge people in particular in the Jewish community who are so blinded by the Democratic Party and supporting the Democratic Party, take a look at what's happening. What the Biden administration is doing is undermining the security of the state of Israel. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. I have often wondered what could possibly cause America to turn on Israel. I believe the answer is now clear. The United States government will one day turn on Israel and bring the wrath of God upon this nation. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.